Hi, and welcome to this edition of We the People. I'm Shane Del Cohen, your host. And we have a familiar community person, Martha Gould, who, as the chairman of the U.S. Commission on National Commission for Libraries and Information Science, has brought us Robert Willard, who's the executive director. And we in the Northern Nevada always appreciate visitors from another part of the country, so welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Want to give a little insight into the Commission's function? Well, the Commission is probably the least known federal agency and also the smallest, but it has a, a, a marvelous responsibility. It is the representative of the people in terms of expressing to government what the library and information needs of the people are. So we, we were established over three decades ago. Uh, the membership is composed of people appointed by the President, confirmed by the Senate. They meet three or four times a year, and they focus on broad national policy affecting libraries and information. Government information in particular has been something we've been working on over the past few years. Access to information that is produced by your tax dollars. Well, I'm going to back up just a little bit and ask Mr. Woolard, when you were a little boy, <laughs> did you think you would grow up and have this rather awesome responsibility? No, I was going to be president. But, uh, <laughs> but this is far more serious. <laughs> but uh, I was interested in libraries and information from an early age. Uh, even had my own little library uh, at home when I was in seventh grade. Um, did not go into a professional career of librarianship, but got into the information business. And uh, I've always been fascinated by computers back when they were room-filling uh, behemoths. And uh, I have uh, just been fascinated by the whole process of accumulating and storing information. Uh, I used to work for a trade association that represents publishers, and this was in the late 70s. And one of the things I would do would be to attend meetings of this organization that I discovered in the Federal Register that was called the National Commission on Libraries and Information Science. So I got to uh, attend those meetings because everything we do is public. in the public eye. Mm -hmm. And became uh, friendly with uh, various members of the commission and began to know what they did. I then sort of dropped out for a while because I went to work, instead of working for a trade association representing publishers, I actually went to work for a publisher. And I worked for LexisNexis for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I wasn't engaged in too much in policy. But a fortunate thing happened in 1992. And uh, a guy I knew as uh, an underclassman when I was a junior, he came in as a freshman. He was a young guy from Arkansas. And he ended up uh, getting a job in Washington as president of the United States. States. And I he said, took your job. <laughs> yes, he <laughs> took my job. And I said, uh, I made it known that I really wanted to be part of the commission. So I was appointed to the commission in 1994. And then in 1998, uh, when uh, our executive director left, um, the commissioners asked me, I had agreed to do it part-time or, or acting for a while. Mm -hmm. And then after a few weeks, they said, how about doing this full-time? I joked that maybe the reason is they didn't like the way I was voting. And the way they were able <laughs> to <laughs> manage that was give me the full-time job, and I had to retire from being a commissioner. Well, congratulations on your appointment. You. Now, you've basically, the both of you, presided over a, a tremendous revolution in our society and in the world, essentially. Well, in a way, um, ever since Gutenberg, we've been uh, experiencing one type of revolution after another. It's just that the pace of these revolutions is coming mm -hmm. so fast. The Commission, uh, if you were to just drop in time and find yourself in the middle of the 1970s, what the Commission would be talking about was copyright because the, the Congress was involved in mm -hmm. a whole effort mm -hmm. to rewrite the copyright law. Uh, you might, a little bit later, you might uh, find them talking about issues having to do with microfilm, of all things. Well, in the 90s, the clear technological development that drove policy was the availability of the Internet. And uh, our commission, for example, does a very aggressive statistical uh, program where we measure what's happening. And we did a uh, measurement of what is the penetration of internet into public libraries. Well, back in 94, about one library in five had, a, had an internet connection, and only half of those libraries, so one in 10, was making it available to the public. 
when we, we did that uh, survey about four more times than when we did it in 2000, we decided we're not going to do it anymore because it was 97% of libraries right. afford internet access to the public. So the public way to obtain information, do you see it moving from books, magazines, journals, and periodicals to internet only, or do you see people still liking to curl up with their information? It's interesting to note that more people are coming to libraries now because of the internet, and that I think there are several reasons for that. First of all, books will never go away. Bob and I don't always agree about that because he's a technocrat and I'm a book person. But what we're seeing is that the internet has become the lifelong employment for librarians. There is so much information on mm -hmm. the internet that unless you have skilled librarians who are knowledge navigators, you have to know when it is easier to go to a book to find the information than to go through a thousand web pages. Mm -hmm. So that becomes very important. But circulation and use of libraries is going up not down. Well, I may be a technocrat, and I don't, uh, don't Actually, disagree with that. Actually, he loves books. But I, have in my, I not only have in my house uh, a home network wired into the internet with a number of computers available, mm -hmm. I also have a couple thousand books, about a thousand of them on Abraham Lincoln. So I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm in both camps. <laughs> I do believe that the, the public is very ill-served by this comment that we don't need libraries because it's all on the internet. I don't know how you measure that to begin with, but my guess is that less than 5% of the knowledge of the world is available electronically. Mm -hmm. Now, I do believe that sometime, and I'm not going to say what the end date will be, it's, in, it's probably measured in, in hundreds of years, but I do believe that eventually all knowledge will be available electronically. I mean, this, that what we see when we watch the old Star Trek TV show and someone walks up and says computer and the computer knows it all, I think we'll get there. But that is a major uh, task in terms of all the data, data transformation. We're looking at that right now with a commission of just taking some of the very narrowly, um, uh, nar narrow stuff dealing with libraries and information that the government has published over the past hundred years and trying to make just that available electronically. And the costs and the problems are, are pretty insurmountable now. But some of us are really waiting. Yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. But I think we have to realize that technology and books, actually there is a symbiotic relationship there. Mm -hmm. One of the things that concerns me personally, and we also addressed it in the study that we did on uh, permanent access to public information, is that once you digitize the material, unless you have in place the strategic planning and the understanding that digitized material information must be uh, refreshed periodically or it disintegrates. But you also have to understand that there is a cost built in that will never go away, and that is not only for training, but for migrating Crazy. to new platforms, platforms that we can't even imagine today. And they're happening faster and faster. But if we're going to preserve the information that we already have in electronic format, and you know, we're moving to e-government. Unless you address all of those issues, unless there are standards so that government agencies, whether they're city, state, or federal, understand that you have to have standards so that everyone is marching in concert uh, and that the information that you're only producing now electronically is not going to disappear, that it will be there. I mean, we have we have the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We have the originals. Mm -hmm. Think about what would happen if we had computers back then. <laughs> would we have the different drafts available to show the progress that ended up with what we know today as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? Or would it, we only have the final version? I mean. You need the history of the legislation, the intent of legislation. And, and to me, this is, this is part of the history of our country. And if we don't preserve it correctly and archive it correctly uh, in electronic format, 
where is it going to go? Well, it's one of the reasons you're here in the studio today because we wanted to talk a little bit about another emergent resource in this information world, information and communications, and that's the public access stations such as the Media Center in Reno. Uh, but there are our networks across the world. What sort of potentials do you see there for integrating with libraries and information science? One of the things that we have seen, and I think we've really been very much involved in it, going back to the reauthorization in 1996 of what was then the Library Services and Construction Act, and out of that grew the Institute for Museum and Library Services, mm -hmm. we're beginning to see a melding together and an understanding of the collaboration and the cooperation that can exist among cultural entities. And I think that one cultural entity that we've so, sort of overlooked happens to be public access television. Now some libraries make use of it, but I think the majority of libraries haven't quite caught on to the fact that this is an enormous tool that they can use for their outreach programs. I mean, we do story hours in libraries. Why aren't we videotaping them and running on our community access television stations to or reach on kids? our community access radio stations? Absolutely. Why not? I mean, that's just one thing I can quickly think of. But there are lots of wonderful programs that go on in public libraries that can be, telev can be videotaped and then rebroadcast to people who can't get to the library for that particular program for whatever reason. And if you have a community access archive, you can also that is create um, a medium where they can be accessed that way and or put in a digitized format, whether it's CD or web page, and store it mm -hmm. and made accessible at a public library. I think the, the both the potential, the capability, and also the, the overwhelmingness of it, of storage of information is, is mind-boggling. Um, I just think in terms of my own home, uh, all of the old five and a quarter inch floppy disks I have, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, it's just, uh, and since I, my wife will tell you, I hate to throw out stuff, I've got it all. Um, Including and, the statue of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> well, everyone should have one of those. But I have, um, I have uh, music in a number of different formats, mm -hmm. uh, including a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which I tried to fire up a couple of weeks ago, and it doesn't, doesn't work anymore. So uh, when you start thinking in terms of the, the wonderful uh, record that we are all able to create of our lives, in terms of, um, I mean, it's astounding to watch the production capability that, that a family going to Disney World carries around with them in these little handheld digital video mm -hmm. cameras. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And yet all of this is creating more and more information that ha has the potential to overwhelm us. And we do need to develop tools to pull out the best, to mm -hmm. get to it, uh, to still save what we don't think is best today because sometimes our perspective changes. Um, I, for example, I can give you a good example. Um, I don't, I can't keep yearbooks. And because I used to work at my university, sure. I was able to have um, more than just my own year. So I happen to have a 1968 yearbook. Well, that has a picture of Bill Clinton in it. And the local television station in my hometown, when he got elected, wanted to see that. So nobody would have said, we better keep this in 1968 because That's right. history changes things. And there may be further history from some other pictures in that yearbook. Yes, there may be. Well, <laughs> a couple of years earlier. A couple of years earlier. No, I see, I see <coughs> this. Uh, community access television as being um, a good partner for public libraries and for museums and for the cultural community or cultural agencies within a community to tell their story, to get their programs out. Uh, and the other thing that I like is the fact that you, you teach people how to use equipment and you teach teenagers how to use the equipment so they become capable of doing things. I think that's very important. Uh, if people that have watched this show for a year or so know that it was students from Reno that took the top national awards 
in media production. And there wasn't very much attention attention paid to that, which is very sad. Well, what are some of the things you think the public could be doing to assist the mission of the commission or to bring forth new ideas, et cetera? Well, we do, as I said earlier, we meet in the sunshine. The, the law requires our meetings to be public. Uh, we also have a web page. So we would welcome people to participate in our activities, to see what we've done so far, and to share with us their perspective, their, their understanding of issues that they think we should deal with. We, have, we also hold hearings. And for instance, um, when the uh, child pornography laws were a big rampant. thing, rampant, and they still keep on, you know, like the Phoenix, they keep on coming through a rebirth. We did hold a hearing on uh, kids in the internet. And it was a very interesting hearing, and we heard both sides of the coin. And in the end, the recommendation that we made, though it was, and we also got in a little bit of trouble with the American Library Association, because what we said is, this is a local issue. It has to be addressed Locally. at the local level. And we came up with a series of uh, policy advice to uh, local libraries and state libraries. Um, and many libraries have followed our recommendations and, you know, have been, have involved the community in setting up the policies for internet access. What are some of the other issues you think that local communities need to look at or are looking well, at? Currently, um, we are focusing very strongly on one particular issue that deals with how libraries can be a tremendous asset to their community in time immediately following a disaster, whether that disaster be man-made or natural. Um, the one thing that is almost mandatory after something goes wrong is the desire for information, to learn more, to learn more about the practical things, about how am I going to get from point A to point B if mm -hmm. roads are closed, mm -hmm. uh, the, the more um, broad contextual things, uh, how does what happened fit into a broader picture of, of global action or uh, mm -hmm. just for example, September 11th was a time when all of a sudden a lot of people wanted to understand more about Islam. And what we have said is that there is a natural entity out there that can help in that. Uh, if you look at all of the information uh, needs that happen in a period like that, a library uh, is a, an outstanding place to fill, fulfill those needs. Now, we, uh, this is a massive undertaking. We, we barely have enough resources to scratch the surface, but we've begun that. We put together a briefing. One of our commissioners came up with the idea of putting together a briefing that could go to policymakers so that they would understand what the implications of it are. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, we've put that briefing on a, on a CD-ROM. Um, we were fortunate to get a fairly experienced narrator to volunteer his time. Walter Cronkite is our narrator. He has and a few credentials. Yes, and uh, the word trust seems to go with him. <laughs> the, yes. uh, what we have said, we called the presentation Trust and Terror because we want to get across the idea that the libraries are a source of trust, trusted information in a time of terror. Uh, so that CD-ROM is available right now. And we, uh, we have a lot we c more we can do with it. Uh, but May I suggest one of those things be a distribution to the media centers around the country? That's a great idea. And we those, can do that's that. the kind of programming that could appear on every cable access, TV, radio, or web stream. Absolutely, and, and one of the problems we have with it is, uh, again, talking about multiple formats of media, uh, mm -hmm. we chose a CD-ROM because a lot of people have computers. They can just throw this thing in their computer and it, it, is, it is designed to be a one-on-one -on -one presentation. We want librarians to take it to their city council members and their mayors, and, and we do know that uh, some libraries, state librarians have already taken it to their governors and their emergency planners uh, in the state. And we want to encourage that. But a, a CD-ROM is not an adequate medium for, for broadcast or for um, uh, cable television. So we're hoping that uh, eventually we'll get resources so we can repackage it in ways that will be more easily distributed. And from what I've seen today, uh, the resources to do something like that, especially the, the talent, seems to be resident at uh, community TV stations. Well, some of us believe so, <laughs> and, and we'd like people watching this to understand that.
but also look at really all the different resources in their community, uh, whether it's a library, a museum, an archive, a cable access, because they all relate so much. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic that worlds that, networks that were always sort of um, operating in a vacuum now really need to come together and capitalize on the information that each one holds. Essentially what you're saying is it, 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 we have to look at big pictures. We can't just uh, mm -hmm. look at the, each little problem as they come along. And we have to see how we can integrate the various resources that are available to, com to a community to deliver services that are needed by the community, especially in the communications and information area. So you need to think lo uh, globally, but you have, have to, to act, act locally. locally. And you kind of have to think out of the box, whether the box was a, a building, such mm -hmm. as a library or a museum, or the box was that TV over there or that computer on your desk. That um, It's a very exciting time in many, many ways and um, cooperation, collaboration, coordination, I call them the three C's. The three C's, right. <laughs> um, but it works. You just have to make people think uh, along those lines because it's, it, it's new for a lot of libraries to think in terms of, of collaborating with a museum and yet over the past five to six years, these collaborations have become almost like standard operating procedures. Well, do you think that's been driven by fiscal or policy? Both. Both. Policy, because it became part of the reauthorization that became the uh, Museum and Library Services Act. Uh, but now fiscally, because you get a bigger bang for your buck. And it relates well to the public you serve. There's a reason why libraries always seem to be looked at when surveys are done of, in terms of government services as one of the best. And that's because people can see a return on their tax dollar. They see libraries cooperating with uh, other entities in the community and they see what the services are. And museums now have tapped into that. And to me, it's just logical. And the public love it because they see a return on the money that they have spent with their taxes. They see a positive return in programs, in people serving the community. And that's what it's all about. And speaking of a return on investment, uh, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't get the, this, this particular observation in. Um, the commission was established, uh, as I told you, about 30 years ago, and it was established to run on a budget in 1970 of about $750,000. Now, today. the purchasing power of that today would be about $3 million. Um, we're at a million, uh, and we are working with Congress to try to increase that. What $3 million equates to in the United States is essentially one penny per every American man, woman, and child, and on that, we can move forward and help deal with policy developments, policy issues affecting the entire information age, but at least the $15 billion that we invest each year in libraries of all sorts. When you start counting public, public libraries, school libraries, private commercial libraries and, and, and uh, corporations, um, we spend $15 billion. The idea of the commission was to say, how do we optimize that? How do we make sure that we're doing it. So you asked earlier how, how people could be helpful. Well, that's one thing they could do, is encourage their legislators to make sure that each of them pay their penny a year to, to make the commission an act, adequate voice on the library and information needs of the citizenry. It's amazing how much we have managed to accomplish on um, this um, rather austere budget. But maybe that's a call for all museums, libraries, archives, cable access stations to put out a penny jar. <laughs> yes. You know, and when I look back on the 10 years, almost 10 years that I've been on the commission and the programs that we've done, the things that we have published, to me, the most important work that we have done has been in the arena of public information policy and the study that we did for Congress 
on permanent access to public information. That to me, because that is really driving in many ways. Well, it's a basic e fundamental. Well, it's a basic fundamental issue mm -hmm. in American democracy from mm -hmm. the time of founding to now. And there's certainly been wonderful historical discussions and over when that issue. When you interviewed uh, Judy Jean Russell a few weeks ago and who is now the superintendent of documents, but was our deputy <laughs> director. Um, and we talked about e-government and some of the recommendations from the study that we did are now being looked at and moving toward implementation. To me, that that's the basic rationale for our existence. Well, we I have taken policy and we are seeing it moved into legislation and into programs. I invite people that are interested in that subject to go into archives and look at those interviews. And in our closing moments, I'd like to ask Mr. Willard if you have anything in your role as a Lincoln historian, as the yet to be president, but particularly <laughs> as the executive director of the commission to the public. Well, the, the idea that, that Martha just alluded to that public information, information that is created by the government is a, uh, such a valuable asset to the society. We, we have been, uh, the name of your program is We the People. Mm -hmm. My most fam favorite document of the world is the U.S. Constitution. I have the preamble of the Constitution framed right behind my desk because I think that simple statement of what government is to do uh, is just astounding. Um, I've, I've said long before there were mission statements, the preamble of the Constitution was a fabulous mission statement. Well, we the people own our government, and in order to make sure it is working right, we have to have access to as much po information as possible. And I think uh, while the Commission can do all sorts of wonderful things, the most important is securing continued availability of public information, both uh, in terms of technological concerns, is, is the format, is the medium going to change, and are we no longer going to be able to access it, but more importantly in terms of policy. Are we going to put restrictions on access because of some other reason, for example, concern about security or just uh, concern about uh, embarrassment? We cannot tolerate restrictions on access to government information. On that note, I, we the people would really like to thank you for those words and all your efforts. And you have a standing invitation to come back and pick up any topic you would like. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank, thank you, you for having us. These are my people. This is a land where my forefathers lie. These are my people. In brotherhood we're heirs of a creed to live by A creed that proclaims that by loved one's blood stains This is my